is Emily Paxia. I am co-founder and managing partner of Poseidon. We have two funds that invest entirely in the cannabis industry. We launched our first fund in 2013, leading into Colorado opening their doors to what we call the adult use market, which takes it a step beyond medical, where you can basically go into licensed retailers, so similar to an alcohol or a liquor store, and purchase cannabis if you're above 21 years old or 21 years or older. Um, we started investing in the industry for a couple of reasons. One was genuinely an altruistic reason. Both I, I'm partners with my brother in this business, and we lost both of our parents to cancer at a really young age, and we'd heard about cannabis as a potential palliative care resource. And so I think that just gave us a much more open mind to consider it a little bit more seriously than other people. When I moved to California in 2011, I saw that the market was growing and that there was very little infrastructure around it, certainly very little funding around it, but believing that it was really a white space opportunity and truly an emerging market. So my brother and I put this fund together over 2012, 2013, and believe it or not, it was semi-challenging to find service providers that could support our business, like auditors, back office, but we got a great team of legal, back office, audit, put it all together and launched it to outside capital in January of 2014. That fund was an evergreen structure, so we were able to raise money and deploy it, and it also had flexibility of having about 20% of it at any given time was in the public markets. Um, since then, that fund's performed incredibly well. The industry's growing at a rate of about 30% year over year. We've outperformed that because we're running at about 60 plus percent IRR net of fees. And we've invested into Canada, the US, Mexico, Colombia, and the uh, European, some of the European states as well. Um, our investment strategy in involves investing into technology that supports the industry, as well as the actual industry of processing, cultivation, manufacturing, retailing, and even manufactured products or goods, like consumer goods. Um, so it's a pretty exciting time, and we just launched our second fund in September of 2018 with a pure venture capital structure focused on investing in Series A stage private companies or later, and we're targeting about 15 portfolio companies in that, in that fund with a little bit larger check sizes on the initial and some follow-on. My background was in research and consulting, so I used to work with a number of large companies such as PepsiCo, American Express, Viacom, and uh, all of them were trying to understand how to develop products or services that could compete with in, within a very saturated market. And so my, my whole career was focused on how do we find the white space, how do we find the wedge for these businesses to drive growth. Uh, so when I started to see the cannabis industry, that was for me all of the white space in the world and so much opportunity. It was a very natural inclination to then think about how do you launch new products or services and how do you identify the market opportunities that would exist. And that was incredibly important in terms of when we investigated and in investing into cannabis was thinking about the entire investable ecosystem of the space, not just investing into cultivation or retail, looking at all of these other aspects that you could invest into, and that served us really well. Um, my business partner, who is my brother, he came from UBS, and then he was at another RIA, so he had the more traditional finance background, and it has worked really well for us to have kind of a qualitative, quantitative mindset around how we deploy capital into the industry. So the majority of our investor base is comprised of family offices and high net worth individuals. There are some limitations when it comes to institutional capital investing into cannabis, as especially in the United States, it's still uh, characterized as a Schedule One narcotic, which is too bad because it basically states that there's no positive benefit to consuming cannabis, which we know from a lot of clinical trials that have been going on in other countries such as Israel that there are actually a lot of benefits to this and even GW Pharmaceutical has a product in the market that has gone through FDA trials and now is in the US market mm. um, for, for seizures. So there's obviously benefits to this but what that does, that Schedule 1 label that it has puts it into what a lot of groups consider a sin industry or it makes it such that because it's not federally legal to bank it they a lot of their LPAs or their agreements will not allow for them to invest into cannabis. So we go to the family offices and high net worth individuals who are looking to find a unique piece of their portfolio that's kind of really a high growth
sector to, to invest in. So with any emerging industry, there's a lot of hype that tends to flow into the space. So when we're trying to identify which teams we're investing in or which companies we're investing in, we're looking for companies that are focused on the long term. We're looking for teams that are looking to build businesses that will be able to exit through either like a private equity acquisition or a merger or through a public market IPO. We're not looking for a real quick flash in the pan kind of hyped up investment opportunity. We're really interested in building businesses so that's why we really like the private side of the industry. The public piece has been very helpful to us because there's a lot of interesting um, cycles that we've seen since 2014 in that space and and we do have an active trading piece of that first fund that we participate in. But on the private side, we're looking at founders who have experience in maybe like industries that they can translate into cannabis, such as consumer packaged goods. Um, we've seen a lot of people pivot in from Constellation brands or Diageo brands, um, from the wine and spirits industry, or even from something like solar, believe it or not, where there's heavy regulation, but it's also very high tech and uh, mechanical development of things. We're seeing those folks pivot into our space for agriculture technology to help improve efficiency and repeatability around the cultivation of the plant. So we look for people who have interesting experiences that, that can translate into this space and also who have experiences of growing companies through to an exit. So we have invested along this entire time into technology companies that support the industry. And so one of the nice things about that is that they really are just tech companies that happen to service a very niche industry with complicated regulations, complicated and nuanced um, metrics in each state that they have to kind of follow. Even weights and measures and the way that they label the products vary depending on the state regulatory uh, regime. Um, We've, one of my companies is a point of sale and payment solution system. They've been in business for four years and they are one of the largest uh, operators in those spaces. And recently we just announced they did a series A round and we attracted two very um, traditional venture funds into it. One is a part of 3G Capital, which is the Kraft Heinz Fund. Mm -hmm. And the other one is eVentures, which is out of San Francisco, which is where we're based. Uh, those companies that I spoke to, and we have several principals from a number of VC funds that are also in that round. Um, and every single one of them, when they were doing their diligence, spoke to me because I'm on the board of that company. And they, sh they all shared with me that they are all chomping at the bit to get into this industry because they are looking for the next high growth opportunity to invest. And coming out of the valley, they're seeing that this is really what's coming next as an in industry to look at. So they were able to get comfortable with it because it's a technology company. And furthermore, that technology company actually has an API that syncs in with the state system to ensure that product that's being re um, cultivated, tracked and traced is then being retailed through legal channels into a consumer's hand and it's all being traced back to the state. And for them, it was a thesis that worked because it's really just tech that's improving transparency around a very niche industry. I think wine and spirits is a natural comparison because uh, it went, it's something that also went through prohibition, just like how we're experiencing it and have been experiencing it for cannabis. And you can look at what happened on the backside of prohibition where all of the excitement around the brands that really developed on the backside of that. We're seeing brands being developed now in our cannabis industry, and we think that some of those will be the ones to be kind of the, the house of brands that will acquire other brands and create these mega brand opportunities. Um, and similarly, I do think we will continue to see patchwork regulations around our industry for many years. We still see that, for example, when I'm investing into Massachusetts, I know there are still dry counties there. And so those are places where you can't retail wine or spirits. So I anticipate that there will be some markets, some states within the US that will have limitations around what it'll be like to commercialize cannabis. Uh, another industry I liken it to is actually coffee, because I do think that there will be a fair trade component to the cultivation of cannabis. We invest into cultivation in Colombia actually because the cost to produce is so much lower than many other regions of the world because it's equatorial in nature. The light cycles work really well for the optimization of cultivation of the plant. But 
Um, we're looking for ways to do this where it can be a global jumping off point as an ingredient into other products like a pharmaceutical factory, for example, in Mexico, maybe the one that manufactures this and then distributes it throughout Latin America. But there are whole groups that are coming together to think about how they create a fair trade infrastructure around the cultivation and distribution of this, very similar to what we've seen with coffee. You know, we've, we've moved forward and we've had setbacks, and I think we'll see that kind of going forward we'll, where we'll make progress down the field and then there will be a couple of things that will push us backwards. A lot of the times that just has to do with the political changes that we see and, um, and also the way the media is viewing the industry because the media does have a heavy hand in terms of perceptions and let's face it, cannabis, there's still a lot of stigma and misinformation around it and if the media feels that it's beneficial to cover the, the benefits of it, then that's a, that's a tailwind that we get to experience. If they want to focus myopically on, um, on some illegal products that have caused problems in the market and not really cover the story very well, it can create a lot of hysteria around the industry, and, and we've seen that most recently. And so it's not something that's unfamiliar to us because we've been doing it for six years, and so we always say it's about getting the pendulum to swing a little bit further so that when it swings back, it doesn't come all the way back to the starting point. And so we're just trying to keep moving it down the field. So I think that in five years, this industry will have continued to see new markets opening up. Right now we have 37 medical programs in the United States and 11 adult use markets. We've got three additional adult use markets on the ballot for the next election, including Arizona, which is a pretty significant market. So I think we'll see this continue to open up. And in 2020, we should also see the Safe Banking Act pass, which will help to get some more capital flows into the industry. Um, we should also have seen several additional global markets open up. And I think that by five years from now, this will truly be a global industry where we'll see cultivation in one region, manufacturing in another, distribution in another. We'll see enormous brands that have developed and that will be available across different markets with a lot more consistency. And I think that we'll also see a true kind of biotech and pharmaceutical industry that's been built around this where we're actually working with the compounds of the plant to come up with some really interesting uh, solutions to a, a number of maladies that we face in our society. So I think it's going to be quite a different world by that point. And five years from now, my, fund, my second fund will be harvesting a lot of our returns by that point because we're a six-year fund. So we're thinking it's going to be a pretty exciting time to, to be seeing the maturation of this market and seeing these companies that will have been running for about a decade really seeing, hitting their points of uh, escape velocity.